We are ready for the reading of our vision statement, please. Richmond Community Schools, a community nurturing mind, body, and spirit to prepare students for lives of choice, purpose, and service. And now our mission statement. Thank you, Dixon. And now our mission statement. Richmond Community Schools guide students on pathways of learning to a future of limitless possibilities. Okay, thank you very much. And now we are ready for our showcase video on the student health services. Mm -hmm. I'm the Director of Exceptional Student Education. Well, my major role is the Director of Special Education over the district. I'm also the coordinator for preschool, and I serve as the coordinator for student health services, and I oversee RTI in the district. We have eight nurses that serve our 11 schools. We have four RNs, and they are uh, including Deb Stracer, who is our head nurse at Richmond High School, uh, Lisa Bowersock, Diane Hughes, and Darcel Bullock. We also have two LPNs, uh, Janetta Nobby, who is at Crestdale, and Sam Rolf, who is at the high school also. Then the board graciously get granted uh, for us to add two CNAs, one at Test and one at Hibbard, and Brandy Newman is at Dennis, and Asia Jett is at Test, and basically they were placed there because of our high numbers of diabetics. Well, their number one um, priority is always to care for the students. <coughs> they also manage the um, chronic health needs of our students that are in the district. They also work with our parents, especially if uh, it's a, a new chronic health issue. They try to work with them on how they can uh, help the student at home as well as at school. Of course, they also work with immunizations and how that all works as far as students being prepared to come back to school. And they um, teach the staff also. If there's a student with a chronic health issue, they do staff development on how um, the teacher will provide uh, safety for that student with a chronic health issue. Well, we're seeing that our uh, chronic health needs of our students are on the rise. Um, we do have the four chronic, if I can say that, four chronic health issues in the district and, and across the state. The first one is asthma. The second one is kind of maybe a surprise to everybody, which is food allergies. Um, you know, it used to be just the peanut allergy, but we have students are allergic to a lot of things, egg, shellfish, you know. Um, and then diabetes is the third, and, and the fourth one is seizures. But we have students here and across the state who have other very chronic health issues. That there are 35% of students in Indiana that have some type of chronic health issues. And that number comes out to be 402,000 students. And then the other piece is interesting that we kind of forget that we have students that are on meds on a daily basis. So we have students that come with short-term meds that have to be um, they have to receive those in the clinic um, and then the long-term meds and then we have students who have emergency meds that maybe they only take for a couple days thank you that was uh, very nice mrs bergdahl and i think that we will be hearing a little bit more about our student health services later in our meeting now we're ready to celebrate the joy of learning. We're going to talk about our first week of school, which of course began last week. The students have been in school um, uh, a week now. Our first week started on Monday though for the staff. And what I would like to do is uh, briefly talk about that whole first week. The first week began on Monday with the entire staff back together again over at Civic Hall, and I want to thank board members for participating in that. Um, we 
we began the week with staff staff development. We began with board re, uh, with building retreats uh, for their staffs, covering a wide variety of, of uh, issues. At Fairview, which is where I'd like to begin, and this would pretty much show you the course of my day on the very first day back with students. Um, I started at Fairview. Many of you started at different places. We had board members, administrators, uh, all covering all the buildings on that first day. I know that a number of you went around and visited all the buildings as, as I did, or at least I, I attempted. Um, at Fairview, we began, as all the buildings did, uh, serving breakfast for our returning students. We had, um, as always, on that first day, we had a number of students who were dropped off on that first day by their parents. We had <coughs> approximately 1,500 students whose parents had not uh, registered or enrolled them. Now, we picked up a number of, a number of students who were waiting at the <coughs> bus stops, waiting on the curbs, uh, who may not have been registered or who may not have been enrolled and we made sure in that first day that they were. <coughs> but I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that. It always seems the first day as it pertains to student transportation that it's somewhat chaotic. Well, it is. And I'm not so sure that until we have everybody working with us to enroll or re-register their students, I'm not so sure that we can avoid some of that. All of our bus drivers worked very diligently well, along with principals and teachers and parents to make sure that after those first couple days we had the students registered on the buses, placed on the buses, placed on routes, and that has be that's beginning to be a little more routine as, as uh, time goes on. But the first two days were, are just routinely difficult. We have a sh uh, uh, demonstration up there uh, to the right of Charles reviewing with kindergarten students <coughs> new procedures. That happened across the district too. In almost all, all settings you, you'd have found that we were talking our kindergartens through their first day. Uh, this happened to be how you go to the lunchroom, how you get back from the lunchroom in order those procedures were happening, but even in our intermediate schools, and you have Mrs. Allen here working with her, uh, with her class, you have procedures. It may not have been lunchroom procedures in her case. Uh, she was talking about how homework is returned, how you fill out the, the sheets if you're doing homework, and uh, she was going over that kind of procedure with her students. So we were dealing with procedures throughout that first day and into the week. At Richmond High School, you have Mim Mimi Brass on that very first day, meeting students, helping them with their schedules, helping them to find their classes. Uh, Susie Hively was there that morning, helping students find classes. Um, we had a number of teachers and counselors who were out in the halls helping to direct students as they were trying to determine how they would get to their first uh, first class of the day for their new schedules. At at the uh, at Vail Elementary, we have Mrs. West working with students. It should be noted that Vail, along with some of the other buildings in our element in our elementary uh, buildings, received new air handling units. For the most part, our buildings opened very <coughs> comfortably. Um, at Westview, we had um, yeah, yeah at Westview we had a roofing project. The roofing project was not totally complete, but it did not impede students and, and uh, parents from coming to school on that first day. At, at STAR, as elsewhere, you'll notice that the students on day one were right back, right back to work. In fact, they were right back to work, and if you look really hard, you'll see that on, those, on the smart board, there was a timed activity. Uh, the smart boards were being used again, technology was being used again, and yes, we were even doing some timed work with our students on day one. And speaking of the students, we will say that um, while a comparison this year to last year is not as clean as we would like for it to be, because this year started a week early, um, 
enrollment is somewhat down. It's not drastically <laughs> down. We were down about 25 students from first day last year to first day this year. Now, we'll be monitoring that and trying to determine uh, exactly where we expect those drops to be. ADM does not take place until uh, September, so it's some time before we uh, have an official count. But we're determining, we're trying to uh, determine even yet where some of the students are. If they have not come to school, we're assuming that perhaps they've transferred. But until those requests are made from the, from the uh, schools where they've transferred, we can't confirm that that's happened. So we continue to do building or home visits and many calls. This week also saw, this last week saw 44 new teachers throughout the district. These 44 new teachers were in a number of places. Among them was uh, uh, our teacher at the Chinese class at Hibbard. She's an American citizen, but she is Chinese. And she was explaining to the students that day that she speaks English very well. Uh, but they are there to learn Chinese, so they'll be doing a lot of uh, in-class Chinese language instruction. At Hibbard, we had locker combinations being learned. And if you went around the district, you'd find at Hibbard, at different places, the high school, and uh, so on, we had new combinations, new lockers, new procedures. Dennis this year was a very different place than it was last year. If you recall last year, uh, they opened without a gym, uh, without their new gym. And this year, they opened as a routine opening. Uh, teachers were at it. Students were at it just right from the very beginning and it was uh, it was they were breathing a sigh of relief from last year instruction at the uh, community youth services was well underway on that first day they too had a had a new principal with Pam Hillegas retiring um, they had a new principal there so they were also learning not just new procedures but um, new staff at the day's end uh, there at Crestdale we had a number of teachers working with students. We had a number of bus drivers working with the <coughs> teachers and students to make sure that the trip home was as uneventful as possible. I, will, I can only gauge the experience we've had here at the central office to last year's experience and the year before and can say that it was remarkably smoother than it was uh, in previous years. Now, for the parents who were waiting and waiting and waiting, uh, beyond the, the expected time for their children to, to come home on that first day, um, I can only say it was better from this end. They may not, they may not report that. But what I would like to say is that uh, <coughs> we, are, we are now seeing the routine established. <coughs> Buses are working on schedule to uh, a great degree. We have moved into our second week already. And I would like for uh, I would like to commend all of our staff and all of our students <coughs> for making it a very smooth first week. But this is just the first week, and we have many more weeks to go. And we anticipate that there will be uh, additional changes. We always know that at uh, for the first month of school, our enrollment changes sometimes dramatically. It can even change after Labor Day. In fact, in years past, it has changed after Labor Day. With schools around the state starting at different times, it should also be noted that staff changes are not unanticipated now. Staff changes have taken place. And as I have conversations with superintendents in the area, uh, they're all experiencing that. It's, uh, that really should be a whole en entire other conversation that we will have at another point, <coughs> but the instability of the staffs around the state may be an issue that we should we should have conversation with and a conversation about. And I'm sure the professional organizations and the state Department of Education will also be having that conversation. Any questions about our first? Could you expand a little bit on why um, why the changes? Sure. 
or why some of the changes, not all of them, obviously. I, right. I can talk about some of the changes. I mean, we had 44 new, new teachers this year. How many? 51. <laughs> I, okay. I'm sorry, I didn't get that to you. Okay. 51 new teachers. That is, that's an enormous increase from years past. I mean, we have considered ourselves to be very busy when we've had 15, 16 new teachers. This is a very different year. One of the reasons that we've had uh, a change was due to some changes in interest payments from teacher retirement fund, the teacher retirement fund. That was going to be lower for teachers who opt to uh, uh, retire later than this year. So some of the teachers who might have opted to stay with us for another couple of years were incentivized uh, <coughs> by the teacher retirement fund to make their decision early, a little earlier. So we had a number of retirees. But what I think contri has contributed in great part to the movement of teachers is that the compensation models that most schools have adopted no longer advance teachers automatically as they once did. So young teachers coming into a system may sit at one place on a salary schedule or a salary scale for more than a single year, could be for multiple years. And the only way that they can receive um, advancements in compensation would be to go to different districts where they may be given their year's credit in placement on a salary schedule. We're seeing it, we're hearing it from different uh, teachers. That has created instability around the state. And if you talk to some of the, some of the smaller districts, there's a small district right around us that uh, probably a little over a thousand teachers or a thousand students. Um, they had 30 some new teachers. So when you consider the the movement and the instability uh, created by that kind of teacher movement, you'll probably see some further adjustments in legislation. Not sure what that looks like, but um, we will be recommending that this whole process be given a lot of attention. Um, those are two of the reasons that we may have some, yeah. some movement this year. <coughs> okay, do we have any uh, reflections, um, uh, board members, <coughs> about the first days of school? I was just... Um, so impressed with um, how well things seem to <coughs> run the first day, and it seems as though the students came in ready to ready to learn and excited about the start of school. So I also appreciate all the work that <coughs> the teachers and the staffs did to prepare for the beginning of school and to keep it going throughout the year. Anybody else? Dixie? Well, I wanted to say, too, and, and the rooms were so, the rooms that I was in, they were so pleasant. And so you could tell the teachers had put a lot of thought <coughs> and effort into the way that they arranged the rooms, designed <coughs> the rooms. Um, very, very pleasant surroundings for kids with lots of, of visuals and things for kids to look at. And most of the ones that I talked to um, said it had been a very smooth beginning this year. I think it might have helped to have the two days as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Two work days were <coughs> But the rooms very were, they were just really, really nice. Mm -hmm. Aaron? I agree. The buildings look, the buildings look very look great. Uh, but I also want to commend the, uh, the staff and parents and students at Dennis as well. I stood out there a couple of mornings watching the bus, the bus drop offs and the parents <coughs> dropping off students. And those went pretty well. The, <coughs> I think the, the bus drive through from 7th to 8th Street has really proven to be uh, a great advantage over there as opposed to years prior to when we didn't have it. And safety, you know, safety is paramount, but uh, uh, there, the students were very mindful of watching out for the traffic. The parents who were dropping off the students and the bus drivers uh, were fantastic. 
Right. Suzanne. I might add that I, um, the week early could have been hard, really hard. And it was hard, but I, but I didn't notice that it was. You know what I'm saying? And, and in the end of, uh, at the end of the day, I don't think it was as stressful as it could have been. The other thing I would say is I think starting on Wednesday is a really good idea. Mm -hmm. I think that it's just the right amount of t days the first week. I think you avoid Tuesday in the first week, mm -hmm. which I think is a good idea. And so I just want to put in a plug for I think that that versus last year was Monday. And the difference, I think, is marked. Mm -hmm. I know those first days are, um, when's lunch, when's lunch, right. especially with the younger right. kids, and when's recess. <laughs> little ones falling asleep on the bus because they're just exhausted. And there weren't nearly those numbers this time. Mm -hmm. By the end of the week the last year, um, there were lots of little ones who were like, okay, I'm not in condition for this. <laughs> and they would have to be woken up before they could get let off the bus. A lot of adults like that, too. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are ready for public commentary. Do we have anyone? We do. We have one person, Rhonda Eason. Welcome, Rhonda. Um, just want to. Um, it's not go there. <laughs> yes, please come up and identify yourself, and um, please know that we uh, welcome you. And we do have a five-minute time limit. <clears throat> That's fine. <laughs> I have a lot to do, so I won't take up your time. I appreciate your time and I appreciate what you do. I am the mother of a fifth grader who is um, going to test this year, and I really have enjoyed. I came up here to go to Earlham, and he um, came into the Richmond school system and is doing a wonderful job, particularly when he got to Charles. Um, we we really appreciated um, the efforts that the staff put in there. Um, I'm adopted mother. I have raised, he's my ninth child to raise. Mm -hmm. So I have two biological children, which your form would call natural children. <laughs> I have um, others that would form, fall under other things. <clears throat> and it is offensive. Um, my son is adopted from Taiwan. It's offensive to um, adopted parents to receive um, any kind of material that delineates their child as being different than if we gave birth to them, because in our hearts they are no different. And <clears throat> the forms from the Richmond school system, um, this particular one is the intermediate school parental consent uh, for participation in extracurricular activities. <coughs> And it asks for the name of the student, the address, and their date of birth. And then we're to check if we're the natural parent, if we're a guardian, our legal custodian, or if we're an other. In my son's case, unfortunately, I think I would be an other. I've checked with my lawyer. He says check the top one or to X the other things out. And I'm just here to say, ask you to change to either custodial or legal parent, please. Take the word natural off. It's offensive. That's all I'm asking. And I thank you very much for all that you're doing for our children. Thank well, you. Thank you. Um, and um, that will be taken under advisement. And um, hopefully um, someone will be contacting you to, um, to let you know um, what comes of this. Is thank that you. correct, Dr. That would Gore? be correct. This is the first time that's in the time I've been here that's the first time that's ever been brought to our attention and it does warrant some some consideration thank you well we really do appreciate you coming <laughs> and uh, sharing with us that's how that's how we get better so <laughs> thank you thank you very much thank you we are ready to move on to consent items <coughs> On our consent items, we have the approval of minutes from our last meeting. We also have a recommendation for approval of, uh, uh, from our human resources, and that includes an addendum as posted to the web. It's not nearly the lengthy addendum that it was last time. 
Also a recommendation to, uh, for the board to authorize a contract um, in reference to EDS number A58515SE2230, and this is a student issue. Those three items I recommend for approval. Okay, do I have a motion? Motion made by Dixie Robinson, seconded by Jeff Slifer. Comments or questions? I just have one question. Um, I know that a year or so ago we provided um, um, monetary raise for our um, paraprofessionals. And that was the group, correct? The paraprofessionals. Yes. And um, I, I have noticed as um, as we have gotten the human resources recommendations that we have a lot of newly hired paraprofessionals, and um, so I I'm just wondering if. We were hoping that the raise, um, the difference in uh, hourly rate would make a difference. So I can tell you that we had several licensed teachers who served as either library paraprofessionals or classroom <coughs> paraprofessionals who've been hired as teachers at, either in our district or other districts. So, created so that's helped create some of those openings. Okay. But that examination will come up again, though. Mm -hmm. okay. um, any other questions or comments? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Now we're ready for reports, discussion topics. Our first report uh, comes from Mrs. Bergdahl. This is the Student Health Services presentation. And it is in keeping with the theme of our meeting tonight. Thank you, Dr. Boroff. Um, I'm very proud to uh, be the director or coordinator over Student Health Services. This is a great group of, of ladies and one gentleman that uh, provides services for our um, students. So. I'm going to go to the flow chart. Oops, sorry. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned in the previous uh, video that you watched, that we do have the eight nurses and uh, RNs, and we have the CNAs and the LPNs. So I would like to um, also focus on Mrs. Campbell and Mrs. Young, who work in my office. And they do have some responsibilities with our student health services. Mrs. Campbell, um, she records and files all of our Section 504 plans that are created in the buildings for students who have health issues that may need, uh, like our diabetics, they may need to plan where they have to come to the clinic and, and do their blood sugars or they have to have their insulin or they have to carry bottled water or our other students who have other health uh, chronic issues such as, like I said, as asthma or um, medications that they need to have a break in, the, in their classroom schedule. So she uh, records all of those and keeps track of those. Last year uh, we worked with technology um, through PowerSchool and always before in the upper right hand corner on PowerSchool for <laughs> student identification. If a student was uh, under our special ed, they would have the uh, teacher of record name. And so we were able to work with technology. And now we have where they have identified as a Section 504 student also. So when a teacher sees that, there may also be a little medical sign there that indicates on the first page of the student page that there is a medical issue that they should be aware of. Then Mrs. Young works. Um, with our special ed students and teachers, and she always <coughs> she also includes the health plan. So a student um, under um, special education cannot also have Section 504, but they can have a health plan that's inserted into their IEP, so that's still available for them to have accommodations <coughs> through uh, their health issues. Next one. 
Do each of the the uh, nurses um, have an assigned building? Yes. What we've tried to do, um, our RNs, like um, Mrs. Hughes, she's really assigned to Test and she's assigned to Hibbard. Um, then Mrs. Uh, Bullock is assigned to three elementaries. She's assigned to Charles and to Star and Vale. And then Deb Strasner, our head nurse, stays at the high school because of the number of students that are there. And if you see the line that's right under her, uh, Sam Rolf is our LPN that's with her. And uh, they run the clinic there at the high school. But if one of our nurses is ill or we have a, um, uh, our nurses go on field trips sometimes with our students that are diabetic or uh, have a, an allergy with bee stings or something, Sam will go over and he'll cover for some of those buildings. So we, mm -hmm. we use him in that perspective. Lisa Bowersock, she is assigned to Dennis as one of our intermediate schools, and then she's also at Westview and Fairview and serves those elementaries. Um, then Janetta Nobby is our LPN, and she is stationed all the time at Crestdale. And she really, her, she serves as a life skills nurse because of the, uh, the fragile students there, but she also takes care of the rest of the building at Crestdale. And then Asia Jett, who is our CNA, she's at TEST all the time. And this year, we have nine diabetics at TEST at the intermediate level. And then uh, over on the, on the last slide is Brandy Newman. She's our CNA at Dennis, and she's there all the time. So our elementaries are the ones that have the rotating uh, nurses. But um, I think I said before that when our nurses are not in the elementaries, it's our secretaries and clericals that step up, and they provide the service for our students who need health care. And if it's an emergency, they can call a nurse from another building. But they do an excellent job with just the daily medications or whatever comes comes their way, so to speak. Okay. Um, in May, when I um, when we talked about the uh, Nurses Month in May. I presented some information to you, the data that was really just about Richmond Community Schools. <coughs> so this time when Dr. Boroff asked if I would um, do a presentation on student health services, I thought it might be interesting for you to see some of the other data across the state of Indiana. So the information that I'm presenting tonight is from the Indiana School Nurse Sur Survey uh, that our head nurses do every year in May. So this is from 2013, <coughs> last year, and there or a year ago, and they're um, getting the numbers from last year's school year. That will be available in November, I believe. But you can see that 49% of our students from Indiana are involved in some type of health or chronic disease throughout the state of Indiana. This includes public charter and private schools, and also grades um, pre-K to 12. Now this is gonna be a, like a little quiz tonight, so mm -hmm. I, thought, I hope you're thinking about uh, some information concerning health issues. In this survey, our nurses are asked what they feel is the uh, most significant health issues that they deal with during the school year. So as you can see, there's asthma, Severe allergies is two, diabetes, which is type one, and then seizures and injuries is number four. Do you, would you have an idea what maybe number five would be? It's a health issue. Can you give us a hint? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a very high rate of this. Nutrition. Almost. Obesity. Related. Obesity. Obesity. <laughs> okay, the next better slide, please. Time. The nurses rated poverty as the number five issue. And they believe that poverty does prevent our students from being immunized when it's required, that it prevents <clears throat> them from receiving medical care, especially when it's immediate or even uh, to require prevention and then it also prevents our students from being <coughs> properly fed. Mm -hmm. So poverty is an issue that our nurses across the state rated that number five. So 
I did have a prize, but none of you won. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's good on the self-esteem. <laughs> wow. Um, you didn't tell us but you one. have another chance. You have another okay. chance. Okay. We'll try to step I up to the plate. <laughs> okay. Next slide. In Indiana, uh, school nurses, uh, they take care of students that have more than 32 different health is issues or diseases. Um, so this is top 10, so you might be thinking about the other five. But the top ten um, and number five, or the first five, I should say, are, of course, we've, we've gone over these several times, asthma, allergies, which is food allergies is number two. And um, that's really been, we have uh, some schools in our district that are peanut free and, and all of that. And then the diabetes and seizures. And then number five is our students who uh, have uh, attention deficit disorder. And so they take medication concerning that. So. Does anybody want to take um, a guess what maybe the next five would be? <laughs> teachers, those teachers are sitting out there, Mrs. Robinson and Mrs. Morgison. <coughs> think what the next five might be? Well, it also isn't included in there. Mr. Slifer, <laughs> you got a guess? I'm, I'm afraid to guess. guess. Okay. For fear I'll be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say mental <laughs> disorders. Okay. We really don't have mental or physical disorders up there, so. Okay. Chronic diseases. Though. I think Jeff diseases. got one. I think Jeff got one. <laughs> okay, next slide. The top, the next five are <coughs> mental health <coughs> disorders, <coughs> migraines. We have a lot of students that come with migraines and have to have medication. And then the other part of the allergies is our environmental, which is our, like the bee, and the pollen. Uh, I know in the fall we have a lot of students with um, maybe like what Mrs. Uh, Hollis is going through with <laughs> carrying the Kleenexes and things around with them. And then we have the gastro gastrointestinal disorders. A lot of this has come up from anxiety upset stomachs. Mm. Kids who are very high with anxiety will have stomach issues, can't keep food down. Uh, and then we also have, at the intermediate <coughs> high school level, we have eating disorders that are very prevalent among our female students. So that's another area that we deal with. And then our orthopedic dis disabilities. We have students that are wheelchair bound, and we also have students who have spina bifida, who is uh, um, disabling. So we've, we've seen that as the top 10. Recently documented in the 2012 and 13 is the increase of other really high risk or what I call fragile uh, health issues. And we see this in some of our life skills, but we also see it in our general ed uh, population. Emergency medications just seem to be very high. They, 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 get, they get hurt or they have some kind of uh, treatment where they fall or they get injured and they have to have some medication that they're seeing in the clinic. The second one is we've actually had students that had to come to the clinic for uh, IV treatment. They may have to take something if they're receiving treatment for cancer or something for heart or even diabetes. So we do have the IV care line. Um, the shunt care comes from some of our students that we have to watch that they're not bumped or they don't fall out at recess or in gym. And then um, we have, a, I think, four or five of our students in life skills who have trachs. Um, we have to make sure that that's always clean and cared for. And then also the tube feedings. The students who cannot take food orally have to take it through a tube through their stomach. So our nurses help with that. And so do our paraprofessionals who've been trained. So they, they assist us in that. The next few slides, I'm just going to talk about the top um, <coughs> four, and I'm just going to talk about asthma first. If you look at the fact that um, 96,000 students approximately have asthma in Indiana um, throughout the school district, <coughs> and then you look at how many days the, uh, the students have missed per year due to the uh, asthma effect. And then we have students who carry their own inhalers because they have to have those in case they go out um, 
outside for PE or they're running or whatever, so they carry. So this is another opportunity for you to make a guess. How many students do you think might have asthma that attends RCS schools? 55. 55. A lot. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? 200. 200. 400. 400. <laughs> mm -hmm. She's our prize winner. 400. <laughs> you told her. <laughs> <laughs> he, he really wanted us That's to give out a prize. I don't, <laughs> learning. I don't think that counts. <laughs> anyway, we have 400 students. I, it was a team, as I suspect. Asthma in uh, the attends <laughs> Richmond Community Schools. And they're all grade levels, wow. I will tell you he that. Separate so. you two. The <laughs> second one. Of course, I guess if I did eight and a half. I'll give you a prize, and it's a box of Band-Aids. <laughs> You're right. Um, we are just about right on. on the next one is food allergies. And like I said before, you know, it used to be just peanut, but now we're seeing other severe food allergies. And we have about 14,000 students in the state of Indiana that frequent, you know, are, they seems to be later on in the elementary and then into the intermediate that they find out that they're allergic to something. So uh, the EpiPens, I know that you've probably heard of those. The students are required to have those at school in the clinic. They have to be renewed every year because they expire. So one of the issues that we really, the nurses try to keep up on that is when they go on field trips. We have to make sure that EpiPen is up to date because if they if they go out and eat something or uh, <coughs> eat something, somebody else has something in their food basket or, you know, whatever in their lunch tray, uh, they would eat something and then we would have a, an episode. So we, we try to make sure that we have the epi, epi pins that are up to date. Um, and you can see about 8,000 students carry uh, the epi pins that are in the clinic. And then I gave you this answer. Last year we had 68 students that had some type of food allergy that attended school. <coughs> Is that number increasing or decreasing? No, we're seeing it increase because it, it, it's a, there's a really long list. I mean, when you look at, I think I said today uh, to the cabinet, we find out that almonds are different than peanuts. So when we say a nut allergy, it could be several of those different type of nuts that the uh, student is allergic to, but eggs and shellfish are, are two <coughs> big ones that seem to be coming up also. But some of our students with very severe allergy, they don't even have to eat it. They could smell it or if they would touch it or whatever, they can have that swelling within their throat that would cause them to have problems breathing or have the blotchy skin with blisters and type things so Aaron. are most of these pre-diagnosed before coming to school or do they most of them are but we do have you know something will happen and then they go to the doctor and then the next day the student will show up and the mother will say well here's an EpiPen we found out that they're allergic to something so um, I think you know it's good for our teachers and our staff and our nurses to always be on alert that it might be something for the first time. But if they if they have something, if they have a history, we have that documented. The third one is, of course, the diabetes. And I know you've heard these numbers over and over. But we do, uh, we have seen an increase of type 1 diabetes across the state of Indiana and across here at our RCS district. The year that we came to you and asked you for assistance, at that time, uh, we had eight in the district, and we were not prepared for the <coughs> influx of what happened in our intermediate schools when those students arrived with being identified. We kind of have a handle on it now because as they come up, we had a, a preschooler identified at Westview uh, that, that's brand new. So as, we, as they're identified and they come up, we make sure that we kind of have the nurses there to know that these students will have to have uh, assistance. And it's always, uh, if you know anything about di diabetes, it's always around the breakfast time, it's always around the lunch time, and then several of them have to have their blood sugar checked throughout the day. Uh, we have some students that have to have checked before they get on the bus because parents are concerned they don't want them to have a high 
or a low, getting on the bus and then riding for a 40-minute period. Um, and we do have several students that are still on syringe that have to draw up the insulin. Um, we have students uh, at the intermediate level that are using the pens. And then some of our students at the high school that are long history of juvenile diabetes are on the pump. And, but they still have to come in and they have to check and we have to check those numbers. So do you want to see how many students here? Richmond Community Schools. 23. Oh, close. Oh, close. Close. 0.33 percent. <laughs> we, we have 25 and we have a couple of students that are take medication, so it's about 28. But they're not take, they're not on insulin. The couple that they're they're watching them, so they're on medication right now. <coughs> but I'll tell you, our nurses are in contact daily with either Riley, Peyton Manning Hospital, Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and Dayton because these students have individual plans. They're kept in the clinic, and every time they come in to have some kind of check, the nurse is writing something down. If there seems to be an extreme high or an extreme low. They're on the phone with that with that <coughs> special nurse that has contact with that plan. So um, it's pretty it's pretty rigorous around, especially around the lunchtime. I think so. And like I said earlier, test has nine this year, which is a very high number. The last one is the seizures, um, and this is kind of you know, the seizure disorder. Is uh, we do have students with history of <coughs> epilepsy or seizure type activity. But we also have students that may have a seizure for first time. Nobody, you know, they've never had one before. So then that always, uh, our nurses are always asking the parents to take them and to seek medical assistance to see, you know, why they would have a seizure. So um, that's always part of it's out there that we don't always know who has a seizure disorder until that happens. So. There's a number missing. 19. Yeah, what is it? You were close the last time, Mrs. Slifer. Uh, 53. 60? 53. Oh, 53. Okay. <coughs> Dixie? Mm. 32. Anybody else? 25. 47. <laughs> Mike. I'm going to go low. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's 62, oh, wow. 62 students that we have that have seizure disorder. And then the type of medications, I just wanted to bring this to you, that when you look at short-term, long-term, and emergency, we have 141,000 different types of medications that can be brought to school. That's over the, you know, the whole state <coughs> of Indiana. So it's just, it's just mind-boggling that there's that many different type of medications out there for our students. Mm -hmm. I want you to know also that our nurses provide uh, continued support, of course, with our immunizations. And we did have the slide up there earlier about being immunized. And our exclusion date is September the 19th. <coughs> Dr. Boroff talked earlier about ADM. I worked with Karen, which is uh, the 12th of <coughs> September. So we kind of put that back. <coughs> Um, they work with, of course, Section 504. They are there when that plan is developed along with the principal and the parent and a teacher. And then any kind of emergency treatment that might happen during the day. And then our other two big things that are up there is the head lice and bed bugs. I know they, 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 they really take a lot of patience for them to you know, make sure that's all taken care of when that happens. But they also are members of our school safety team and the crisis team in the building. And then the last, uh, <coughs> last piece of information is they continue to work with Wayne County Health <coughs> Clinic so that we can provide the, the best medical care for our students. They work with our parents on how to, to seek other resources in the community when their child is identified. And then they train our administrators and <coughs> teachers and staff on how to deal with the chronic health issues. And I'll just say this, the teachers are just fantastic if the kids need to leave for something or have some kind of uh, a treatment, they've, they've always been very cooperative with our nurses on how to do that. So we, we appreciate their assistance and the administration assistance. So <coughs> that's, that's all I have. I'm very 
um, proud to say that I believe that our nursing staff does a great job for our 5,000 some students every day and um, well, obviously if it wasn't for them some of our students would not be able to attend school that's right I mean what it's obvious with with some of the and I and I, I believe that's true because you know we we just don't turn down the kids who have health issues we try to make sure that they can attend and be in the classroom and and we just make little adjustments or accommodations but well we certainly appreciate all okay. that they do and uh, thank you very much thank them for keeping our children as healthy as possible <clears throat> the next report is on our energy management project mr. Tidrow mm -hmm. I'd also like for mr. Tidrow to update the board and the public watching this uh, about our phone system it's we've had an unusual <laughs> experience right. well, it's one of our utilities so um, we hope to realize two days worth of, uh, of uh, gains in our uh, not paying for it since we were out we had an outage for two days we are back up um, and uh, what we can what we can uh, f uh, uncover is we may have had some kind of uh, maybe a, a lightning strike or a, a power surge happen Monday night uh, we, we think it goes back to about 2 a.m. is about the last time we saw any kind of activity on our phone system so um, anytime you have a lightning strike or some some kind of weird electrical thing and mr. Slifer know things can look normal uh, mr. Nash uh, went over there right away uh, yesterday morning and investigated everything looked normal lights were on things were flashing and doing the right things but as we inched our way back uh, we, we, we go on the outside and our service provider is frontier we go from our inside and make sure that we have connectivity both ways and we did it until it kind of meets in the middle so to speak where we kind of take the handoff from from frontier uh, services and then pump it out to the rest of our buildings so there was a uh, some kind of break in the uh, the equipment there we we put in uh, several new cards and uh, <clears throat> into different slots and had uh, uh, no less than five support people from from frontier helping us out so uh, at about 440 this afternoon uh, we got things back running now uh, we're not sure again what caused it but uh, we're going to do some investigation but we want to make sure everything was back up and running I appreciate the parents and uh, the school system personnel uh, transportation department to kind of work around those those issues so uh, we're, we're back up and running I will say uh, I know our our social media uh, contacts work we use Twitter Facebook website I know it works because I put out a, a tweet last night and and Rachel contacted me right away for some more information so that she could put it out <coughs> on their information channel which was the plate in item but also uh, it triggered some response from the radio station as well uh, this morning so the, the key there was to make sure that our parents could contact our, our schools and so forth uh, and, and, and get that going but it also uh, pointed out a, a few areas that we could um, look at some type of secondary or backup systems uh, to help that um, we always have what's called we call it the bat phone if you go <laughs> in any of the offices we have a red phone Dixie you're, you're aware of it but that's an emergency phone that is not tied into the regular network that we can take phone calls or we can uh, primarily use to, to make the phone calls out uh, we were we were minutes away from activating those uh, today uh, when our system came back up uh, the problem with using those is it's one phone call at a time secretary have to answer answer the phone call maybe take a quick note hang up pick it up again so uh, that was going to be uh, plan plan B but we didn't really have to go that way but there was no time during the during that outage that our our uh, facilities couldn't get a hold of the emergency personnel f you know fire police and so forth but uh, and of course we always have cell phones out there that people uh, have but any questions or but we are back and going so uh, energy management program uh, I want to quick give a quick update um, on this and I'm going to ask mr. Ron Mays to step forward and, and give some more detail but um, a few months ago we got approval to do a uh, energy management program to help us reduce some costs um, I just want to remind everybody about the, the the three key best practices that we we put forward one was encourage behavior changes 
for the use of our uh, facilities and energy management uh, pieces. Consider our infrastructure upgrades, which uh, some of that went into place this summer with our new HVAC systems. Uh, and then update our procedures and monitor the controls. Uh, and with all these changes or uh, uh, upgrades and so forth, we do have some must-haves. One is always ensure that safety of facilities. We're not going to shut lights off and so forth with students are going to be in, 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 the, in the hallways and so forth and, and other personnel. And also ensure that educational environment is unaffected. So. <coughs> I want to give a quick update on what has already ha happened so far. far we've, we've had a small task force with Mr. <coughs> Glenn Slifer, Mr. Jeff Slifer, myself, Ron Mays, and we got some information from uh, Karen Scalf's department. Uh, we had uh, two meetings uh, over the summer, and uh, this is where I want, uh, I'm going to ask um, uh, Mr. Mays to go into some more detail of, uh, of some of the other uh, things that we've done so far. So. Thank you very much. What we're uh, working on now is a model that we can uh, work with and then um, recommendation to the committee and then go from there. And the model we're using is for uh, Charles Vale, <coughs> Fairview, Westview uh, schools is because those are the ones that have the new you know, ventilators in and those are the ones that, that we're now presently working on, on the controls. What we're looking at, of course, is start of school from 750 and dismissal at uh, 2.40, we're looking in, a, in an occupied mode when we have students in the room of cooling of 74 degrees, uh, heating of, of uh, 70 degrees in, in the wintertime, and then we have to bring in outside fresh air uh, while the school or the room is occupied, and we're looking at 15% uh, uh, CFM, uh, which is a code requirement, and then we're figuring on uh, 35 students per classroom is what the rooms were designed for. And then the humidity, we're trying to keep it at between 50 and 60 percent. And, and those are the numbers that, that we're working with. And for instance, uh, in a classroom uh, right now, we're setting up just these four schools. At 720, uh, 30 minutes before the start of school, we'll either heat or cool uh, and bring the room up to the proper temperature without outside air. As soon as the students come in, then we'll introduce the outside air uh, 15 minutes um, or at the, start of, at the start of class. And the reason why we're doing that is what we've uh, done in the past, and all schools have done this in the past, is they bring the outside air on the same time they have to heat the room. So you're heating this maybe 20 degree air or uh, 80 degree air with heating or cooling. So we're going to heat it first and then we'll turn the outside air on. And that's, that's a, uh, uh, a big energy savings through the year. And then the unoccupied mode when the students leave at uh, night, at like at 225 or 15 minutes before the end of the day, uh, we'll cut back on the, on the heating or cooling. Uh, and then we'll, at 240 when they leave, then we'll shut the outside air off. And this is what we're trying for all of the classrooms. Then when we get to the office area, they're on separate units, and, and we'll work the office area uh, in, in discussions with the principals based upon their usage of that space and how late they stay. <clears throat> and then you want to look at the cafeteria, the library, and the gymnasium. In all the schools, it's a different zone, or it can require different uh, uh, codes and, and requirements for heat and cooling. We also have to take in consideration, for instance, on Charles, they have after-school programs in the uh, uh, cafeteria and in the gym. And then we know that boys and girls are over at Fairview uh, in the gym and two or three classrooms. So we would adjust those units, and we can do those individually, adjust those units so that we have the proper uh, air. And then if, that, if this plan, if, if it works, and we've been monitoring the, the temperatures, and if this works and, and everybody's in favor of it, then we'll ask the committee to make a recommendation to, uh, to go that way with, with all the schools. What, uh, what we've done so far uh, are, are some recommended uh, savings that uh, uh, Mr. Tidro uh, referred to just a minute ago, uh, that for exterior lighting, we want to take all wall packs, pole lights, 
and decorative lighting, we want to <coughs> rework the timers on those so that so that they're on and off uh, at, at at different times. For instance, if you go by test, we don't need all the lights on that are on the decorative lights are on the building, and we just need a few parking lot lights on. Security lighting is what we need, and that's what we want to try to address. Uh, we've talked about the classrooms. Uh, turning the lights off when when students leave when it's not occupied by the students or the teacher same way with the restrooms uh, lights off in, in the cafeteria lights off in Tiernan Center and then we've been working with the custodial staff uh, so at night when they clean that uh, typically they would go in and turn all the lights on uh, in one corridor and then as they clean them they would turn them off now what they're going to do is when they go in the room to clean it, they'll turn the light on. When they leave, they'll turn it off so that we don't have uh, a couple hours of, of light uh, burning. Now, we did notice we, we took some reviews on Tuesday. We went around because that's, that's the day that, that the students are gone early, but the staff is still there. So I visited two or three schools, and in every case, the gym lights were on, all the cafeteria lights were on and no one there and 50 percent of the classroom lights were on so this is what we want to behavioral uh work that, that we want to work with the committee and, and there's there's where our big uh, energy <coughs> savings is then we also want to control the building ventilation and that we're saying that any ventilation that occurs when students are not in the building will lead to a lot of wasted energy and that we want to avoid ventilating empty buildings and we do that now and so we're going to ventilating means fans on uh, in some of the gyms the outside air is on and and just eliminate the, the ventilation the other thing just to, to bring you up to date what we've done uh, today <coughs> is that again we've adjusted all the new unit ventilators at Charles Vale Westview and Fairview uh, we we are trying to uh, uh, we're working on a schedule to automatically turn off the computers in class student computers in la in classrooms and in labs so that they're not uh, running all the time and then uh, we did we we replaced uh, light fixtures uh, ballast and lamps uh, for a more energy efficient light fixture uh, in conjunction with the Indiana Energy rebates and Mr. Slifer uh, worked closely with us on this and getting the rebates. It's kind of mind boggling here. Uh, Richmond High School, we replaced, uh, this is ballast and, and lights, 882 uh, uh, fixtures. Baxter, we did 437 fixtures, or a total of uh, 1,319. And we'll realize a 30% energy savings on those light fixtures. With the uh, uh, exception of Tiernan Center, we went in and, and we also did eight uh, gymnasiums through the <coughs> system. And those gymnasiums had the old uh, metal halite bulbs that, that takes a while for them to come on. If you turn them off, then they have to cool down. You turn them back on again. And, and we, we put 150 fixtures in and we did uh, Hibbert, Crestdale, Dennis, Baxter, Fairview, uh, and we had a we're going to have a 52 percent energy savings in those uh, lights and and again those are those are real those are real numbers and we'll, we'll see those savings so will you be monitoring the electric bill each month yes is yes. that how this works is the electric bill the gas bill Yes, actually, the custodians, uh, they keep track of those so that we not only do we get the, the readings from the various utilities, we'll have our own readings to make sure that, that, they, that they match up. So you have a percentage, uh, we'll have, an estimated yes. percentage yes. that it is hoped will be saved yes, and through that's, this. And that's what we want to come back to the board with to show you uh, what those savings are. We should realize some... Uh, this month, uh, we should start realizing more than in September and October and come back and show you uh, how it's working. Our goal was uh, about $200,000 savings in the school year of uh, 
14, 15. Okay, we will look forward to you coming back. And I have one more thing to say. Okay, if possible. Great. Uh, we are starting our energy management committee uh, this month. Actually, our first meeting is Monday, and uh, we have a representative from uh, each school, uh, a faculty member. We have some administrators on there as well. But I would like to thank uh, Ms. McDermott for handling that task because it wasn't uh, three or four people. It was. 10, 11, 12, I mean, and she got someone from every building. We really appreciate that because we need that buy-in and that help as we uh, go to the next level to do some programming, uh, energy usage tracking, and also to make, a, make the recommendations to our superintendent, which we hope will make some recommendations as early as September. Right. You know, we're, we've got some things going here. We want to get things uh, off and running, so but that's all, all right. I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is the strategic plan, <coughs> which has been underway since the board set the three goals. At your places, you'll, you'll note uh, an updated document. It says in the corner, <coughs> draft August 13th. <coughs> this includes some baseline data for some of the uh, objectives that we've set for uh, promotion of the goals. Each goal has three objectives. Uh, each objective then has a number of indicators of success. Now those indicators of success uh, may not be comprehensive or um, they, may, they may not be the same ones that you'll see by the end of the year. We may, we may have more to support those objectives and the, those goals. But for the time being, these are the, uh, these are the indicators and what we have over here uh, to the right would be baseline data. <coughs> We're still working on common metrics for the non-quantitative <coughs> type uh, measures. And we're not ready to uh, publish those yet, but they'll soon populate those, which will establish then um, uh, a foundation for us to create a target. We're still using the 2020 goals that were set by the board a couple years ago as we determine our trajectory for uh, goal attainment. <coughs> um, let's see. The other thing that you should recognize is that these are not strategies. The strategies will appear in other documents created primarily by cabinet members and building principals. Those strategies may be different from building to building. They'll certainly be different from cabinet member to cabinet member. But those documents then uh, form legs to this one, enabling us to achieve the goals that you have set in your, in your selection of goals earlier this summer. <coughs> this is not a complete document. It's a draft document. But uh, it's well underway. And I want you to see the progress that we've made. Okay, so will you review, at least for me, <laughs> um, what, what's next? What are the next steps? So well, what needs to be done to? The next step would be uh, one of the next steps. There, there are several steps, and they're all considered next. Okay. One of the next steps would be to uh, work with the principals to, to help them establish, uh, we'll probably release a template for them to then populate and they'll look at each of these objectives and talk about how that will be achieved at their buildings. The cabinet members uh, have each worked on this. You'll see their names here. Uh, they'll be working on, on their strategies as well. We will then take this to the REA for some input. Uh, the, the REA members um, always see things from a different uh, objective because many times they're in the trenches working with what we're trying to accomplish. And uh, so everything is subject to uh, change. We would hope that if they have some recommendations, we can somehow incorporate those recommendations into the, into the plan. The next piece would be to come back show you what our targets are, what our baseline would be, and then you'll have that document in preparation for the first CPAS uh, report. And 
we'll work from this document then to take you towards the end of the year, which would show some progress towards increasing opportunities for student and stakeholder engagement, the measures of academic, social, physical, and emotional success, and so on. There are some strategies that you'll hear about. Um, one of the strategies, for example, is to meet with all of the um, Centerstone staff. Hasn't happened yet. Um, but we're meeting with the Centerstone staff, and the primary obje objective of that meeting is to, well, maybe two, two objectives. One is to find out how they work with our building faculties to um, identify mental health issues and then the strategies they use to deal with those mental health issues. But secondly, as teachers are working to um, cope with the mental health issues there in their classrooms, we want to know uh, what, kind of, what kind of strategies the Centerstone staff has been doing to teach our teachers how to deal with those issues in ways that are not um, d disciplinary. Mm -hmm. There's a difference when you're handling mental health issues uh, from discipline to therapy. And our teachers don't go to school to know how to therapeutically deal with mental health issues. They tend to deal with mental health issues the same way they would deal with a disciplinary issue. And those are not necessarily strategies that work in both cases. The other thing that I'm going to challenge the, the Centerstone staff to do is to begin working with us, and perhaps they can take us to a document that would show us what the, what the growth model is for students in a, in a uh, social and emotional uh, area. Well, I mean, what does growth look like? We can talk about academic growth, but what does emotional and social growth look like? And we're looking to Centerstone to help us on that. That's a huge strategy in and of itself, but that's an example of how we move this plan forward at a lower level than just the board. You should see something at the end of the day about how we've developed some strategies, how we've made inroads, how some uh, numbers have changed, but those strategies are so important to help us get there. I'll try to keep you apprised of some of those strategies as time goes on, but that's what well, it looks like. and those strategies are in keeping with our um, vision of of educating the whole child. Correct. And um, and so I guess that's <coughs> one of the things that I wanted to add was that I appreciate having our mission and our vision um, front and center, and I hope that as you are working with administrators, principals, et cetera, that also the beliefs that the board had carefully uh, worked on will also be front and center <coughs> because I think those beliefs do represent what we want for our students. And um, so that's, um, I think, very important mm -hmm. that those beliefs are there the belief, also. The belief statements help us understand what you're trying to accomplish in the goals. They're, they, they are helpful, um, and they'll be used throughout the year in a number of ways. Um, any other comments? Well, I was just going to say, I, th I think with those things happening, that it brings some issues and concerns we've had in the past to real focus. And um, things will be uh, worked on in a very positive manner where I think we'll see some some good results I hope well and another thing I was thinking about was um, you know so often we tend to um, take our data and um, kind of silo the data and so because I'm thinking that sometimes we do things like um, we asked for there to be a report on uh, how many students are sent to the office. Well, I think, um, I'm thinking that more important information is students 
uh, how does this affect their academic achievement when they're sent to the office or mm -hmm. their, uh, you know, um, you know that that needs to all work together, and um, so I hope that um, we can somehow um, make sure that we're not siloing our data, but we're always looking at the um, the needs of the child, the academic achievement, the emotional well-being, and so forth. And um, so, anybody else? <coughs> Any? thoughts okay well we will look forward to we appreciate the the, uh, the three goals I think that's helped mm -hmm. to, to do exactly what you're talking about keep keeping things from being siloed now we are ready for action items our first several action items mm -hmm. are going to come from mrs. Scalf so I will open this by uh, asking her to take 6.01, 2, 3, 4, maybe 5. Okay. okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, we'll start out with the cash and transfer tuition for this year. And the student cash and transfer tuition rates um, are estimated calculations based on previous year expenditures and estimated revenue to come in this year. Uh, those are um, listed in the board documents that are posted to the web. You also have a copy on the agenda. Um, tonight I ask that um, you accept these rates um, for the 2014-15 school year as they're presented for students who come in after ADM count in September and um, that they are calculated on a per diem rate, which you can tell in the rates and um, that goes until January 1 and then they are if they're in the February count then that's it they're just one semester per se um, calculated per diem and um, then if they come after the February count those are per diem as well based on these rates so I ask that you approve those as presented okay motion made by Aaron Stevens Seconded by Jeff Slifer. Comments or questions? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Okay, the next um, recommendation is um, that we are submitting for your consideration and approval to advertise uh, form one, two, and three of the 2015 budgets. Um, the budget forms are required by State Board of Accounts to be advertised. Uh, we have to publish them in a designated newspaper. Form 3 is approved by the Board of School Trustees. Uh, publishing Form 3 also notifies taxpayers of the public hearing on the 2015 budgets, which will be held on August 27, 2014, and there will be an adoption date of September 10, 2014 at the school board meeting. The 2015 budgets are not being approved by this motion, but the administration will be authorized to advertise the levies for the 2015 budget in the taxing funds. The tax levies as shown on Form 3 to be advertised will not be the final levies, which come in typically lower. The higher levies are advertised so that the budget process can take into account unknown and uncontrollable occurrences and still provide Richmond Community Schools with the revenue to which it is legally entitled. I ask that you appro approve the request to advertise the 2015 budgets as expressed in Form 3 presented. A motion. So Suzanne Derengowski, seconded by Dixie Robinson. Comments or questions? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Okay, moving on, we have the annual financial report. Please find um, in the board documents the 2013 annual financial report for Richmond Community Schools. IC 5-3-1-3 requires the secretary of each school corporation to publish an annual financial report one time annually, not earlier than August 1st and no later than August 15th of each year. 
Upon publication, each school corporation shall submit a copy of the annual financial report to the Department of Education on or before August 31, 2014, and the Department shall make it available for public inspection. That is available on the Gateway this year. That is a change from previous years. So for our public, that is there. This report will be published within the indicated period of time in the Palladium item, and proof of publication will be submitted it to the Department of Education no later than August 31st, 2014. I ask that the board approve the request for permission to advertise the 2013 annual financial report as presented. I need a motion. Motion made by Suzanne Derengowski, seconded by Aaron Stevens. Comments or questions? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Okay. Um, the next uh, recommendation is an agreement between Reed Hospital and Richmond Community Schools. Um, it is an athletic department agreement and it is an amended agreement. It is not a new agreement. The original agreement was brought to you on June 25th, 2014 and was approved on that date. This amendment uh, clarifies section four, subsection H, and adds language um, to the effect of um, misconduct by personnel. So that is the change that is before you tonight. No other changes have been made to the document. And I uh, ask for your approval and recommend that you approve it as presented. Okay, motion made by Jeff Slifer, seconded by second. Aaron Stevens. Comments or questions? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Okay, and the, the last uh, recommendation I have tonight is a cooperative agreement with the City of Richmond. Um, the cooperative agreement is submitted um, to provide a course in fire and rescue and EMS for the RHS Career Center. This is a new course offered for the 2014-15 school year and the agreement has been reviewed by legal counsel. We will be reevaluating the agreement for the 15-16 school year and we will bring it uh, for next year um, to you in July or August of next year. So um, this agreement is for the 14-15 school year and I have Mr. Wedlow here with me tonight. If you have any additional questions that I am unable to answer, he is here and will gladly um, give you more information. So I uh, ask that you approve the request and accept the cooperative agreement with the City of Richmond as presented. A motion made by Dixie Robinson, seconded by Suzanne Derengowski. Comments or questions? I just wanted to say I think this is a wonderful opportunity for our kids. And um, I really think that, that our kids will benefit greatly from this. Mr. Wedlow, would you like to um, come and say anything? We would um, welcome that. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, I have to agree with you. Um, I, I think this is a terrific opportunity for Richmond Community Schools and uh, Richmond Fire Department to partner and provide opportunities for our Career Center students. Um, our students will have an opportunity to get uh, up to nine credit hours, dual credit hours, if not more. We're actually talking with Ivy Tech to finalize those uh, dual credit opportunities. Uh, basically what we have an opportunity to do is give our students another career pathway. These students will have the opportunity to get fire and rescue uh, training. They'll get understanding about fire science. They'll have the opportunity to get hands-on experience working with all of the equipment, handling emergency calls. Uh, the first year, uh, they'll get Fire Rescue 1, Fire Rescue 2. Uh, the spring, they'll go out and take tests, both written uh, and also practical, and then they'll have the opportunity to get certification there. Year 2, they'll have the opportunity to uh, receive emergency medical service, which will uh, pretty much parlay into EMT certification. Uh, they'll also get hazmat awareness and hazmat operations <coughs> certification. This, in turn, will give these kids an opportunity to graduate and then have the opportunity to volunteer with the Richmond Fire Department. 
to have the opportunity to get a start a career with our emerge, emergency medical training team. And then when they turn 21, they'll have a, their, their foot in the door with our Richmond Fire Department uh, to start a career. 21, 20 years, retired 41, <laughs> and they'll be able to start another career. <laughs> um, so I just think it's an outstanding opportunity. Uh, we've gotten off to a tremendous start. Our kids are very, very excited, and uh, I'm, just part, I'm just glad to be a part of it. How many students are? We have 16 in Richmond wow. students. Great. And so is this a year-long program then? Those yes. same 16 will be in it all yes. year? Yes. So Wonderful. this 16, these are 16 juniors. <clears throat> so they'll go this year, and then they'll be our pilot crew for next year. And then hopefully we were able to bring up to 20 more students in next year and keep this program moving wow. forward. Great. Aaron. Question one. Uh, this is solely for our students at this point. Um, there, there, there are opportunities for all of our Richmond Area Career Center uh, uh, constituents for our uh, Randolph Southern and Northeastern. Uh, just some of those students decide to go in some of our other pathways as far as vocational programs both on campus as well as Ivy Tech. But the, the, the opportunity is, is there for those other schools. Second question I had is the cost of the uh, $150 additional cost per student. Is that going to be prohibitive for some students to that they would not be able to participate? No. And no, that, that, okay. no. Mr. Stevens, that fee this year, we're taking evaluation on that fee. We are not charging students this year that $150 fee. Um, we're working with the fire department to clarify what that will entail so that in the future we can determine if that fee is substantiated okay. um, in the contract. I want to make sure that that doesn't become a stumbling block for somebody it will not. who may be interested. So. It will not. Well, thank you very much. This thank you very much. Impressive. Glad to be here. And we're going to vote now. All in favor, signify <laughs> by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Yay. Our next item, uh, we turn to Mrs. Stewart, company salary increase. Tonight, we're recommending an increase in the accompanist hourly rate from it's. A, 884 I believe an hour to 1250 an hour we had a gentleman who's been with us for several years and he retired um, and we need good accompanists and uh, as Mr. Ecker and Mrs. Bratton were looking for people to fill his shoes they couldn't find anyone who would work for that <coughs> amount they're uh, charged $15 an hour um, to take lessons or that's what they charge to give lessons so we started there and we're able to negotiate it to 1250 an hour okay I need a motion to accept this a motion made by Jeff Slifer seconded by Dixie Robinson comments or questions well if I read correctly in in your um, addendum I think you have a good one mm-hmm all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Motion carried. The final action request uh, I'll present is rather simple. Uh, two meeting date changes, <laughs> uh, board meeting date changes. Our September 24th meeting occurs on the evening of the homecoming parade. So we're recommending that rather than 5.30, that we move that board meeting to 12 o'clock noon that day. On October 22nd, we have <coughs> fall break, and um, October 22nd falls right in the middle of fall break. So we think it would be best, since we have an additional Wednesday that, that month, to move it to the next Wednesday, October 29th, uh, which would uh, enable us to have that on a regular Wednesday evening. It just won't be the fourth Wednesday of that month. So. I'd recommend that those two dates be changed, uh, dates and or times, so that we can have those published and uh, make sure that they're well advertised. Okay, I need a motion. Motion made by Aaron Stevens. So moved. <laughs> and seconded by Suzanne Derengowski. Comments or questions? 
All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. And that concludes our action items. We are ready for the second public commentary of the evening. Do we have anyone in the audience <coughs> wishing to speak? Bethany, I thought sure you were here to speak to us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, seeing none or hearing none, we will move on to our work session. Good evening, Dr. Borf, members of the board, cabinet. I'm here to talk to you about the assessment results. And when we say assessment, we talk about a lot of things, but this particular assessment that we're going to speak about is ISTEP Plus, which is the state mandated assessment, and how we are responding to that data here at um, Central Office and in our schools. So as we begin to talk about test results, I want to talk about some basic underlying assumptions. And that first one is one that I'm afraid we may have lost sight of in the state of Indiana. Test results should be used to help students learn. If they can't do that, we shouldn't be doing it. And so that's the number one underlying assumption. The public does have a right to know how we're doing. We're publicly funded, and um, they have a right to know how we are using their money to educate children. Um, test results can be used to help us identify needs in curriculum and instruction at the classroom, grade, school, and district levels. The test results are only going to tell us a part of the story. It's incumbent upon us to dig a little deeper and to find um, the other parts of the story. When we talk about test scores, when we want to compare those scores year to year, we can look for some trends. But we need to keep in mind that when we're talking about test scores from one grade level to another, we're comparing two different groups. If we look at this year's fourth graders and compare them to last year's fourth graders, last year's fourth graders aren't fourth graders anymore, they're fifth graders. And so um, when we do those kinds of comparisons, we just need to remember what we're looking for is trends that carry over year after year that we might begin to um, dig a little more deeply into. Um, I'd also like to say, um, I have a tendency to move very quickly, <laughs> so if you need to at any point along the way, wave me down, slow me down, um, stop, ask a question. This slide just comes directly from the ISTEP manual, and I've highlighted in red um, <clears throat> to remind all of us that the purpose of the ISTEP, the reason we do it is to measure student achievement in the subject areas and on the standards that the um, state of Indiana said is important for kids to know and be able to do. I would like to invite you, I don't have any prizes, but I would like to invite <laughs> you to think about the conversations and the context in which you hear the word I-STEP brought up that has nothing to do with student achievement. Throw some out at me. Teacher evaluation. Mm, comparing it to other schools. Mm -hmm. comparison, comparing us to other schools. Grading our schools. That really doesn't have anything to do with why we're doing it. So. I just kind of want to refocus us on why we do ISTEP. Um, I also wanted to point out as we talk about this year that we're in a transition this year and next year, but um, we knew early in the year last year that um, the Indiana Modified Achievement Standards Test, which we call IMAST, which we use for our um, students who are eligible for special education, we knew early in the year that that was going to be phased out this spring. So in the spring of 2015, our students were no longer going to be able to take that as a part of our waiver from the next <coughs> child left behind. And so we had the option of continuing to carry those students on the IMAST for one more year and then for a lot of those students, moving them into high stakes testing with no warning, just there they are. And it, you know, they have to take um, either ISTEP or ECA at the high school. So our special education teachers under Barb Bergdahl's leadership started really looking at students and, and having conversations with parents and students and moving them off of IMAST and back onto ISTEP. And so um, we had uh, 214 students who took IMAST in the spring of 2013. We were down to 121 students who took IMAS this um, spring of 2014. And so we had, you know, a large group of students who were taking an uh, assessment that was much more difficult than they had seen in previous years. And so I think that we need to keep that in mind as we look as our, at our results. And I will say that unique in Indiana, we, we probably had some of the lowest percentage of our students taking IMAS of anyone in the state of Indiana. So. Okay, so the first question in looking at results is, 
how do we do this year? And so whenever we start looking at test results, we usually start with sort of a balcony, large view, just overall, how did we do? And so uh, we are blue on this chart, and the state is red. And you'll see that overall, when we combine grades three through eight in English language arts, 78.1% of our students met the benchmark to be considered passing um, ISEP. <laughs> and 75.5% of our students met the benchmark in math. And so when we compare ourselves to the state, in English language arts, we're pretty close to the state average. In um, mathematics, we fell way too short of the state average in uh, that area. And so another way that we begin to break it down is to look at grade level. Are there some grade levels where we're seeing real areas of concern or real areas of strength? And so. Um, by the time I made this slide, I figured out Richmond should be red. So now we're in red, and the state's in blue. So when we look at this, we can see that in English language arts, um, for instance, at the seventh grade level, we're just a little bit above the state average, not as high as we would like to be. But um, across all of our grade levels, uh, we are not at the state average. And it is our goal to be at or above that state average if we're going to ever reach that 90 to 100% mark. And so. Um, we look at the English language arts by grade level, and then we look at the math by grade level. And what you'll see in math is a lot more um, of a consistent growth across all grade levels. And there are math teachers and English teachers who would argue these points, but I think that we can all agree that math is much more easily delineated. We can look at standards in math, and it's so much easier to break those standards down into finite groups of um, learning to say, today we are going to work on percentages. We don't get to say in English language arts, today we're going to work on uh, vocabulary because it, it doesn't exist outside of comprehension or uh, decoding. In English language arts, things are so much more intricately woven that um, it's really much more difficult to break those down and teach those. And so we see a little more consistency in math. But um, this is where we were in math by grade level when we looked at um, us versus the state. So we know where we are this year. So the next question we ask is, are we doing better than we did last year? Or do we do worse <coughs> than we did last year? <clears throat> and so what you hear, have here is 2013 compared to 2014. And you can see that there are three of the six grade levels where we actually um, overall at, the, at a grade level did better. So at the fifth grade, the seventh grade, and the eighth grade, we saw some growth in English language arts. At the <coughs> fourth grade level, it's statistically about the same. A little bit of a drop in third grade and a drop in sixth grade. And then at math, um, you can see uh, third and fourth grade were our areas of largest concern. And um, I think Mark Millis wanted to kind of chime in on that. We started talking about <coughs> our response to that. So don't let me forget to uh, call on you. Um, fifth grade, we saw um, growth. and um, Seventh and eighth, or sixth and seventh, we were holding somewhat steady, but then eighth grade we saw a drop too. Oh. So, as I said earlier, when we're looking at scores that way, we're saying, well, we saw a little drop, we saw some growth. We're not talking about the same group of kids. And again, if we can do, we would see drops from third grade to third grade to third grade over a course of two or three years we would become very concerned that we had some issues with our curriculum, with our instruction. But a one-year drop is just sort of a, a call to us to begin looking at those things. So another way to look at the scores would be to say, I want to look at last year's third graders and see how they fared this year as fourth graders. And so that's what this chart does. If you look at, for instance, English language arts, last year that particular group of third graders had an 84.1% passing rate. Well, this year our fourth graders had an 84.3% passing rate, which says to me, not exactly the same kids, but many of the same students, we're not losing ground with those kids. Those kids are continuing to move. And so um, if you look from fourth grade to fifth grade, a little bit of drop in English language arts, that's that transition year. They've moved from fourth grade to fifth grade. Fifth grade held steady. Um, sixth grade had a tenth of a point drop. And seventh grade actually um, made growth from seventh grade to eighth grade. If you look at mathematics, you'll see somewhat of the same trend. So um, when we're looking at um, group statistics or group results at the school level, especially if we have a group of students who is a fairly stable um, cohort, this is very helpful. 
So we know where the results were. Those don't really tell us anything. We really need to dig deeper. And so some of the questions that we ask, first of all, are there certain areas, certain standards that we're just not covering well in our curriculum? Um, are there certain student groups that we're just not reaching? Are there whole blocks of students that aren't getting what they need? Um, are there individual schools that we could look to who either have a significant need or some who may be doing so well that we should look at what they're doing and replicate that across the district? <coughs> and what other factors could there be that might be interfering with learning? So one of the things that we can do is pull the academic, academic standards summary analysis. And the one that I have here for you just as an example would be a third grade um, report. And so the first, the top ones are the English language arts and the bottom ones are math. And I'm going to try to use this pen, find my pen here. So this column here where it talks about percent mastery is a good place to begin because we know that we want our students to be at around 80 percent mastery on all of the standards. And so what you can see is in English language arts we're hovering 77, 78. So when I look at those scores, um, one of the conclusions I can draw is at the third grade level for English language arts, we have a fairly stable, um, consistent curriculum. There aren't any areas where we are ha seeing huge peaks and valleys in terms of what our students are able to do and demonstrate, um, which says we, we need to look at amping up what we're doing but continue doing what we're doing. Um, when I look at math, I see scores um, 73, 74, 75, but I see one here of a 71, it's number sense, which by the time you're in third grade, we may not be spending as much time on that as, as we should be. You know, so um, we look at our, the next thing that we would do would be to look at our curriculum map. And so this is the curriculum map for the coming year. You know, I can go back and I can look at last year's curriculum map and see if perhaps things weren't covered the way they should be, but that um, cow's already out of the barn, so now I need to look at where we're, <laughs> where we're headed this year. So, <laughs> God, you city people. Homage to Bob. Okay, so one thing I wanted to point out was that these curriculum maps are based on the brand new standards that were published by the DOE over the summer. So these are the standards our teachers are using to instruct our students. And Envision is the um, instructional resource that we use. It's a Pearson product and it is our textbook. And so um, that is the basis of what we do. It's not all we do. We bring in lots of other materials. But I want you to just take a note and um, see that we don't teach the book in order. And that wasn't my doing. That came from teachers who sat down with the standards and looked at um, what they were covering, what made sense for them in terms of the order of um, coverage, and to ensure that we had covered really critical skills by the time that we took ISTEP at the end of March because we can't wait until April or May to teach some of these important standards. So um, the one that I was particularly interested in based on the report that I just showed you was number sense. And so here's number sense and these are all the standards that make up that um, particular category. So when you see an X, that means if you teach the materials, you are going to get really good coverage of that. Where you see an A means you're not going to find that standard addressed explicitly in your textbook materials because our textbooks are Common Core. We purchase Common Core textbooks and they're all based on the Common Core standards. Where there's an X, that's where the new state standards match word for word with the Common Core standards. Where there's an A is a new standard that Indiana added that doesn't really, it didn't really fall anywhere in those. So what that says to our teachers is you need to make sure you teach it while you're teaching these other things. So you might need to use your iPad, your smart board, um, other materials to bring in some of this um, content. So when I look here I say number sense at third grade gets pretty good coverage, you know. We're doing a pretty good job. And in fact, my guess is when the teachers build their common formative assessments, those standards are going to show up on those assessments. So they're going to know at the end of second try which students are strong at those and which aren't. So as a teacher, I might say to myself, you know what? It's really important my kids get these, but the test is going to be somewhere over here. So I'm going to make myself a little note about the big R. I'm going to review these a week or two before we take I-STEP just to make sure they're really solid with the kids. So this is how. We are planning instruction based on our results and teachers are planning their instruction based on what they know their kids need to know and be able to do. 
Any questions so far? Well, but we're basing that, but they're not going to be taking I-STEP this next year, right? They're not going to be taking I-STEP, but they're going to be measuring the same standard, same standard okay, it will categories. Be. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, um, for instance, number sense was on I-STEP. It just now, it's number sense on the new I-STEP. So the, the standards are a little different. And I, I would say that if you looked at the old Indiana standards, the Common Core standards, and the new Indiana standards, you would see a lot more um, similarity to the Common Core than you would see to the old Indiana standards. <coughs> yeah. um, this is just another example that I provided for fourth grade. And again, you know, just kind of looking at it and saying, where are there some areas where I might be concerned? And one that might pop out here is geometry for fourth graders. You know, I, are we hitting it? And so we would kind of do the same thing, look at the um, curriculum map, make sure that geometry is covered, and make sure it's covered before the test is taken. And then again, do we have enough resources? Are we spending enough time? And do we need to review before the test? So those are the conversations that go on in our buildings. Um, we'll be doing more professional development in terms of using these exact maps. These are new maps. but. <laughs> Um, our teachers meet once a week in data meetings, and these are the conversations they're having. Uh, they're going to be building assessments that measure these standards, and those, they'll be meeting and talking about their groups of students. How are we doing on this standard? What else do we need to do? I see your class is at 70% on this standard, mine's only at 30. What did you do? How did you teach that that made them get that so well? So that's the basis of those data meetings that they have. Then the other thing that we need to do, the old uh, disaggregation word, is we need to look at our student groups and saying, are there some student groups for whom we're not hitting the mark? And so uh, this, for instance, would be for third grade math. And so the um, one that's circled in red, that's the median score for the entire group. And so I just kind of look down it and see, are there any things that jump out at me? So for instance, the one where it's circled in yellow, those are our special education students. Our students who took the test with accommodations with an IEP actually outscored the median, whereas the ones who didn't have or who did have accommodations needed the accommodations. It didn't level the playing field. They're still not scoring as high as their um, non-disabled counterparts. One thing that tells me is our special education teachers and our teachers are doing um, a marvelous job of deciding which kids need accommodations, because the ones that didn't have them clearly didn't need them. They're doing well. The ones who did have them need them. So that's one thing I notice. I always look at the male versus female um, because we want to make sure that we um, are not losing half of our population um, or kids are all having an opportunity to achieve. And uh, at least I can tell you for third grade math, um, we're fairly consistent. Our girls and our boys are doing about the same. Um, we also look at um, our all of our minority populations. But the one that is always the one that is of most concern to us is that um, vast difference between our students who are on paid lunch and those who are on free and reduced price lunch. Um, you know, being the Title I person, I can tell you the whole purpose of Title I is to close that achievement gap, that we should not expect to see that achievement gap that we still see. So we refocus our efforts again to ensure that these kids come to us and um, are ready to learn and are given every opportunity to learn. Uh, this is just another example, and this one for is, is sixth grade English language arts. And um, for instance, here in yellow, there weren't enough special education students who took the test without accommodations to even um, come up with any kind of a summary number. But if you look at our English learners, by the time they're in sixth grade, and uh, we have a real huge increase in our number of um, students who are English language learners within the last year. And we also had a large increase in the number of students at older grades who uh, present to us with very limited English skills. And so uh, for a long time, we lived at, you know, by the time we were in sixth grade, they were fairly fluent. But I can tell you that we have many sixth graders who are at the level one, level two fluency level. You know, they're at level one or two, which means that's going to significantly impact learning. So one of our responses to that is um, we have hired an additional ENL teacher to help meet the needs of these students. Um, if you look at the male versus female in math, you begin to see um, 
or this, I'm sorry, this is English language arts, you begin to see some of that um, gender difference breaking loose. Um, the girls are doing better in English language arts at sixth grade than the boys. And again, um, everything that, every way, I'm sorry. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. It's one thing to, to, to look at it grade level by grade level, but then it's another thing to look at it and to see if our trend is that as they get older, um, our <clears throat> I think you've been looking at our data, and I think you've been looking at national data, that we do a pretty good job of keeping the gender differences in check till about fourth grade. At about fourth grade, you begin to see it, and it's not just us. If you look at the state data or if you look at national data, actually, you begin to see the girls do better in English language arts and the boys do better in math. It, um, Definitely. I mean, we've, we've had book studies. <laughs> we, we've done all, um, really looked at the, um, sort of the research, and it, it, it definitely is happening. So do we, are we beginning to address, is, are there things that we can do to close that gap as the students get older? Yes, there are, and we have actually had conversations. I mean, we have had some schools even suggest perhaps separating kids by gender uh, because there's some research that says that might be one of the ways mm -hmm. to address that um, you know the um, at test they have the new stem class to try to get more students involved in stem and obviously more girls involved in stem um, else give me some other examples here right off the top of your head I don't even have a prize <laughs> so oh, we, that, have, we have the camps. Oh yes, uh, yeah, the um, camp that we had this summer, the invention camp, and you know everything that we did with the science grant obviously was geared exactly to that. Because it would be interesting then to see what's happening at the high school level also, mm -hmm. because you know do, does the gap become larger and larger mm -hmm. as the older they get? So, okay, we will do that. So one thing I think you can take away from this is you could spend days and days and days digging into this data and looking at this data, and trust me, we do. But it doesn't do any good for me to do that at the district level and just leave it there. We ask our schools to follow the same process, um, and, and it's a lot of work because it's a part of their school improvement planning process. They, they have to know where they're at in order to plan instruction, to plan professional development. They take this data, but this isn't the only data that they take. They take data from um, what they do in their classrooms. They take data from the formative assessments that they've used. They take data from their observations, all of that data to help them plan. And so um, this is just a piece of what they're, they're asked to do. So some of the other factors that we talked about, and I've, I know we've talked about these at board meetings before, but we can't ignore the fact that there are things that happen outside the classroom or within the classroom instructionally or non-instructionally that impact how kids are able to perform on a standardized assessment. You know, one is ineffective instruction. We don't have much of that going on in Richmond Community Schools. When we have a teacher who, struggle, who struggles, we do all we can to provide the support. We don't want them gone, we want them better. And we do all we can to help them get better. But there, there is always the possibility that teachers will lose jobs <coughs> for ineffective instruction. It's happened, it doesn't happen often but it definitely is something that needs to be dealt with. Behavior has been another topic. Um, I think, um, Mrs. Morgison, you said, uh, is there behavior that is impacting student learning? I think that unequivocally we'd say yes, absolutely, behavior impacts learning. And so um, we tried to respond to that in one instance uh, <coughs> by creating a classroom to help us get a handle on some behaviors. Um, by looking at are there policies or procedures um, sort of <clears throat> maybe not formal procedures that are happening that might be impacting student behavior or student achievement. For instance, I don't send you to the office when you misbehave, but I send you to my neighbor and you go over there for, you know, half an hour. Well, if you're over in that classroom for half an hour, are you really learning the curriculum that I'm teaching? And so really looking at things that are going on in our buildings to ensure that kids are not losing instructional time because if you miss out on instruction, you're gonna miss out on learning. Um, interruptions to instruction, 
I don't even want to talk about the weather. We're going to have a very mild winter. Uh, other interruptions to instruction that we had this year, and I take a huge brunt of the responsibility for this. We had a perfect storm last year where we wanted to bring in some assessments that would answer board goal questions about where are we with our students in reading and math. So we brought those in. At the same time, the teacher said, hey, how about we do diagnostic instead of um, predictive acuity? So we did that, and we just ended up with more assessment than even I could keep up with. I mean, it was, I was buried in it, so I knew kids and teachers were buried in it. So that, that was a distraction last year. Fidelity of implementation is a word that you hear thrown around all the time <clears throat> in education, but really what it means is finding out what the research says we should be doing and then ensuring that we're doing that. Um, making sure that our, our instruction is direct and explicit, making sure that we are uh, posting the standards, that kids understand the standards, making sure that kids know why they need to know the standards and they know where they are in terms of their learning on those standards, so those student data binders, so all of those things getting our eye back on the ball, making sure those things are happening. And student engagement, we've talked about it at the board level, we've talked about it at cabinet level, at corporate admin level, um, and the teachers have talked about it. We've had, it's been a huge focus of professional development, um, but learning how to weave all that we need to do with technology and things that help kids engage. Those are all um, things that we need to keep focused on. Um, looking ahead, I'm, I would like to say it's going to get better, but I don't think it is. We have a brand new set of standards this year. We have new high stakes assessments. We have one coming in the spring, and then we're going to have a different one next year. We've <coughs> sort of been given the heads up that there's going to be a pilot of the new one in the spring sometime this fall, which will again be an interruption to instruction. We have new curriculum maps for teachers to learn and use to um, guide their teaching new formative assessments, which um, I'm going to knock on wood and say um, teachers have been very happy with what they've been doing so far. Um, the feedback has been very, very positive in terms of what we've put in place for this year. Uh, but even with all that going on, our goal can't change. We still have to focus on high student achievement for you know, everyone in our district. So, Any questions? Thank you. And do I need to put the assessment calendar up here? Are we going to talk about the assessment calendar now? No, okay. not tonight. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. We are ready for board reports. Old business. I don't have anything that I'm bringing to the attention of the board. I just wanted, again, to remind um, um, people sitting at this table as well as the public that you have until August the 22nd at noon to file a petition <coughs> to run for school board. We have a District, district 3 um, seat open, uh, well, not open, but um, a district three seat that is um, is available if you so choose and we have two at-large seats so um, I encourage uh, people to please file by August the 22nd time is running out and you will get to joyfully sit at this table <laughs> making great decisions for our students so that's my report. Anybody else have anything to bring before us this evening? You know, this, I have something. It's not in the form of a report, really. It's an acknowledgement and a statement of gratitude. This morning, uh, there was a gas, uh, gas line rupture over by Earlham, and we were put on notice that we might have to evacuate Richmond High School. Richmond High School's evacuation plan is Earlham College. <laughs> <laughs> so we quickly uh, determined what options we had, what would be the, the, the safest and most accommodating place, and we looked to uh, Seton High School and St. Andrew Church, and they 
didn't even hesitate. When I called over there, they said, we'll, we'll make room. Um, you tell us what you need when you, when you need it, and we'll, we'll revise our schedule. This is their first day. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. First day of school. So um, I expressed appreciation, told them that we would call back <clears throat> one way or the other. When we were given the all clear, we, we called. But I should mention that Mr. Rule, uh, before he hung up, said that they would be praying for us over here, <laughs> knowing that it looked like 14 to 1500 kids might descend on them in a few minutes. I was doing some praying for them as well. <laughs> but we do appreciate uh, we we appreciate their willingness to not even hesitate to uh, help us with that. I also um, I have a feeling that we miss someone tonight. We had Carrie Ann Pope Meek in our audience, and I don't know how she got out of here without us acknowledging her, <laughs> but she did. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm going to make an apology and also uh, congratulations at the same time, because Carrie Ann um, has been uh, reassigned at the <coughs> high school, and she is uh, an administrative assistant yes. and Dr. Borf you could probably speak more to that but anyway I do want to say to Carrie Ann I'm sorry that we missed you and um, congratulations so um, you well, will and her new role puts her in several different capacities at the high school but she is really working very diligently on um, the uh, scheduling piece, which is ongoing, but I will say that uh, at the beginning of this year, we had one of the smoothest beginnings at the high school that we've had in a while. It wasn't just uh, Carrie Ann, it was a number of people who worked together to make that happen. But she's also working this year to help us bring together the AP Academy, which you have heard about earlier, and the early <laughs> college efforts. So she's in a number of areas. She is an administrative assistant, which uh, uh, has a very open definition, just like today, uh, when we decided that we needed to look at evacuating Richmond High School. Uh, a number of us went into a mode very different from our daily routines. But she will, she will assist Mrs. Wolpe. Uh, she already has an office on the first floor, not far from the main office and she's hit the ground running. We're very happy. You know, it didn't occur to me that she was out there for that purpose. <laughs> We've just come to know her doing what she's doing, and uh, we'll make sure that your words are Tomorrow's emphasized tonight. tomorrow at the high school. Okay. Anything else? Um, uh, press conference? Anyone from the press have anything? Okay. Well, I think we are ready for... Adjournment.